when you give the praise up front, a lot of times it seems disingenuous. And, you know, everybody's familiar with this approach, and so they're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. And so the, the praise doesn't really get through. Mm-hmm. If it does, if you're able to deliver it in a way that feels authentic, then, you know, sadly, primacy and recency effects are pretty strong. Mm-hmm. So we have a sharper memory for the things that happen at the beginning and end of a conversation than we do for the middle. And so oftentimes the, the, the criticism actually just gets drowned out and it disappears. Right. What the, what the data suggests is that you actually just want to do either just criticism followed by praise or praise followed by criticism. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's a time and a place for each. Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with thought leaders such as Kevin Kelly, Brad Feld, Steve Blank, Gretchen Rubin, Tim Harford, Adam Grant, Tim O'Reilly, Tyler Cowan, and many, many more on topics that will help you gain a distinct advantage, not only in the world of creativity and innovation, but in your entire professional and personal life. Each and every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some short, high impact and easily digestible insights to have you finishing your week on a high. Future Squared is powered by Collective Campus, a corporate innovation school, consultancy and startup accelerator that works with large organizations to help them unlock their people's often latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, creating a culture of innovation, or partnering with startups, visit collectivecampus.io. So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 236 with Adam Grant. Adam Grant has been Warden's top-rated teacher for four straight years. He's been recognized as one of the world's 25 most influential management thinkers and the world's top 40 business professors under 40. Adam is the author of three New York Times best-selling books, translated into 34 languages, including Originals, Give and Take, and Option B, which he co-wrote with Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook and Lean In fame. As a contributing writer on work and psychology for the New York Times, Adam's op-eds on raising a moral child and a creative child have each been shared over 300,000 times on social media. His research focuses on generosity, motivation, and meaningful work, championing new ideas, personality traits like introversion, and leadership, collaboration, culture, and organizational change. His studies have been highlighted in David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell, Drive by Dan Pink, Quiet by Susan Cain, and Thrive by Ariana Huffington. Adam is a member of the Lean In Board, the founder of the Authors at Warden series, and the co-director of Warden People Analytics. He has received the Excellence in Teaching Award for every class he has taught, and is also a former magician and junior Olympic springboard diver. We unpacked as many insights as we could in our 30-minute conversation. Expect to learn a number of things, including one, how to deliver radically transparent feedback without coming across like an asshole, two, the value of maintaining humility even before you've made it to the top, and three, how to 10x your organization's brainstorming efforts. We explored these topics and more in my conversation with the one and only Adam Grant. Welcome to the show, Adam. Oh, thank you, Steve. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. You're joining me from Philadelphia, is that correct? Philadelphia, guilty as charged. (laughs) Guilty as charged. And I'm sure the reason why everybody has tuned into this podcast is to find out whether or not you have scaled the rocky steps lately. (laughs) You know what? I haven't in a few years. I think I'm overdue. (laughs) Man, I've never been to Philly. The first time I make my way down there, I think I'm just going to get off the plane. I'm going to catch a bus or an Uber or whatever it is to the rocky steps run the way up to the top, take a photo, and that's it. And then I'm good. I can just go home right after that. I think that's all that you need to see here. There's there's no history of, you know, the founding of America or anything. Just the Rocky Steps. No, nothing like that, of course. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, Adam, excited to chat to you today. And just for our audience's benefit, Adam is nursing a cold right now, so you'll just have to forgive him for that one. Adam, you describe yourself as an organizational psychologist studying how to make work not suck. Your most recent project is a tech-produced podcast called Work Life with Adam Grant, and you unpack a hell of a lot of different concepts and unconventional workplaces 
in the program. And one such concept is uh, Ray Dalio's extremely successful investment firm, Bridgewater Associates, where this whole concept of radical transparency is, I guess, taken to the extreme. But there's a lot of noise about this concept today, yet for so many people, it's still quite a, shall we say, radical concept. Why is that? Well, I think, you know, (laughs) in a lot of organizations, there's a strong norm of politeness. Mm -hmm. So we, we wander around not wanting to hurt anyone's feelings, we, you know, we kind of walk on eggshells, we, we tiptoe and, you know, that's understandable, right? It's one of the ways that you, you know, you maintain smooth relationships and harmony, but it really stands in the way of people learning and growing and improving. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was pretty fascinated when I first went into Bridgewater because I'd had a bunch of students work there and I'd, I'd talk with some colleagues who were there and they all, you know, they all described it as if, if you think about all the stuff that you've ever thought about other people. That's critical. Mm -hmm. What if you just said all of that? And what if everyone said all of that? You know, my first reaction was, I'm not so sure that would work. But I have to say, after, after seeing it in action and studying it, I came away intrigued by the fact that, you know, I think everybody recognizes the value of a support network. Mm. You know, we, we know when we're struggling, it's, it's so helpful to have a group of colleagues that we can lean on for encouragement and enthusiasm And I think what what Bridgewater does is it builds another kind of network, which is a challenge network. Mm -hmm. It's that that group of people who you know you can count on to push you by telling you the things you don't want to hear but need to hear. And, you know, that can be really painful. But if you recognize that they're doing it because they care about you and they want to foster your development, then, you know, it it doesn't feel quite like you're getting stabbed right in the back. Or at Bridgewater, they would actually call it front stabbing. Because they say it right to your face, uh-huh. and um, you know it's a little bit like uh, like a, being a professional athlete. Mm-hmm. So you know, if, if I think of a, a tennis player like Serena Williams, can you imagine her coach saying to her, "You know, Serena, I think you'd you know you'd you'd have a more effective serve if you tightened your grip a little bit on the racket," mm. and then Serena saying, "Well, no, I don't want to do that." She knows the coach is there to help her get better, yeah. and that's the environment that Bridgewater is trying to create. Yeah, or, or, uh, or Serena taking it personally and, and getting all defensive about it. And it's funny what you said there about human beings and our innate need to be polite, if you will. And just yesterday morning, I was running a workshop for a, a Fox Sports here in Australia, and it was a hackathon, if you will. And I was telling them how that just that morning, I'd been out to breakfast, and it wasn't the best breakfast in the world. And I was all, you know, I was hell-bent about giving them some constructive criticism so that they could get better. But then when I got up to the counter to pay the... Uh, the guy was like, how was your smash turbo? Was it good? And I was like, mm, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> and it's just, even though I'm not doing him any favors by saying it was fine, it's just that innate sort of, it's your default position to just say the polite thing. It is. And, you know, I think that, that the sad thing about that is that when we're, we're thinking about what to do in a dilemma like that, politeness feels like the right thing to do, mm. but it's a very short-term focused response. Yeah. Because it might leave the person feeling good, but it's not actually doing anything for them. Mm. And so, you know, I, I find it helpful to just ask the question, look, do you want to protect this person's feelings in the moment or do you want to actually help them, you know, learn in the long run? Yeah. And I think, you know, for the most part, if you were to reverse positions, you know, do, do you want somebody to bite their tongue or do you want them to, you know, to give you some candid feedback? Exactly. Most of us prefer the latter. Exactly. And, and you've talked about this topic of uh, ghosting where, and I quote, I'm so uncomfortable making you uncomfortable that I'm going to protect myself from that pain and make you hurt a lot worse. Did I say that? I believe you did. <laughs> I think I did say that. I, I, I even remember when I said it. Yeah. You know, I, did, I didn't even know that ghosting was, was a thing until I had some students explain it to me. And they said, you know, it's it's pretty common now, when you know, when you're you you're, you decide you're gonna end a relationship with someone, mm-hmm. you just stop answering their texts and their calls and their emails. <laughs> yep. And I was like, what? You just you just disappear? They said, yeah, you turn into a ghost. Mm-hmm. And I was just appalled by the concept because it's just a small amount of discomfort for you, mm-hmm. right? To say, look, this isn't working out. And instead of you know embracing that discomfort. You put that person in a horrible position of wondering, did something bad happen to you? Mm. And, you know, how am I such an awful human being that this person doesn't even want to talk to me and doesn't have the decency to to let me down, you know, with with a little bit of honesty? Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I, f I find that pretty pretty striking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, we're trying to build here in this team a radically transparent environment. And I guess everybody's come out of environments where that just wasn't the case. So I mean, what sort of advice or what sort of things have you seen in your research, Adam, about how to best give that radically transparent feedback? Because, I mean, if I tell somebody that I don't like their jacket, for example, I'm being radically transparent, but I'm also being an asshole. And of course, that's some of the kind of things that I'm trying to tease out in this team. But I mean, what kind of things yeah. can people, how can people approach building that type of environment? Well, I think the first rule is that the feedback is supposed to be relevant. Mm. So if you were to go to Bridgewater and, and tell someone you thought their jacket looked stupid, <laughs> they would tell you that your criticism was stupid. Of course. Because it, you know, it had no bearing on what they're trying to accomplish you know, as a team or a company. Yep. Uh, beyond that, you know, the most popular way of, of giving feedback is to, to deliver what in the U.S. we often call the feedback sandwich, mm -hmm. where you, know, you, you start off with some praise to butter the person up, and then you know you you bring in whatever your your negative comment is, and then you end on a positive note again. And so you're kind of sandwiching the criticism between two positive slices of bread. We call that a shit sandwich here in Australia. <laughs> I was gonna say I thought you had a you had a better term for it. So <laughs> you know I think the the appeal of that is as as the feedback giver it feels good, right? Because you're you're starting and ending on a positive note. Mm -hmm. Turns out feedback receivers hate it. And the data suggests it often backfires. There, there are a couple of things that go wrong when you do this. The first one is that, you know, when, when you give the praise up front, a lot of times it seems disingenuous. And, you know, everybody's familiar with this approach. And so they're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. And so the, the praise doesn't really get through. Mm -hmm. If it does, if you're able to deliver it in a way that feels authentic, then, you know, sadly, primacy and recency effects are pretty strong. So we have a sharper memory for the things that happen at the beginning and end of a conversation than we do for the middle. And so oftentimes the, the, the criticism actually just gets drowned out and it disappears. Right. What the, what the data suggests is that you actually just want to do uh, either just criticism followed by praise or praise followed by criticism. And there's, there's a time and a place for each. Mm -hmm. So you know, most of the time when you ask people who are going to receive feedback, do you want the good news or the bad news first? The vast majority of people want to hear the bad news first. They don't want to, you know, be left with, with uncertainty. They don't want to be wondering and worrying. Okay, what's going to come? And so, just to put it right on the table and say, hey, you know, I have some suggestions for you, and I want to, I want to bring those out. And then to be able to say, you know, after that, all right, let's talk about, you know, how to, how to build on those suggestions, and you know, hopefully, that will enable you to improve. Yeah. There's also, you know, I think a situation where where you reverse that, which is. If you're going to criticize somebody in a domain that's really core to their identity, then that's when they're most likely to get defensive mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of try to try to resist the, the feedback and, you know, because it's, it's a major blow to their ego. Yeah. And there, there's a whole body of research in psychology on this, on what's called self-affirmation. Uh, so let's say, let's say, Steve, you see yourself as a highly creative person. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to tell you that, you know, you're, you really fell short on creativity on a project. Mm -hmm. The best thing I can do before that is to praise you in a completely different domain. So I might praise your, you know, your brilliant analytical skills mm -hmm. or your decision-making capabilities. And what happens then is you, you don't have as much of your ego staked on your sense of being creative because you're like, well, you know, yeah, let's, you know, if, if I come in and say, hey, you know, Steve, I'm really impressed with your analytical skills. You know, your creativity on this project was a little bit lacking. The, you can say, well, you know, I wasn't as creative as I would have liked, but mm. at least, you know, my analytical skills have, have been strong and I've proven myself. And so sometimes that's an effective way to go. Yeah. And, and I guess also um, not necessarily criticizing broadly some character attributes about a person, but more so some specific behavior that perhaps wasn't up to scratch. Um, and also... I mean, is there value in providing them with some sort of clear next steps around here's how you might address that rather than just leaving it open? So I guess the, the question I'm really asking there is being specific with the feedback versus just saying, oh, your performance in that particular engagement wasn't up to scratch. Yeah, there was a, there was a great uh, meta-analysis, so a study of studies that uh, Kluger and Denisi did literally analyzing 100 years of feedback research. Mm -hmm. And they found that about a third of feedback conversations backfire. So they cause performance to get worse instead of better. And, you know, that's the bad news. The good news is a lot of feedback conversations do help. And when they compared the successful ones against the, the ineffective ones or even the counterproductive ones, they found that the more the feedback focuses on the person, 
the worse it is. And as you get closer and closer to the behavior, the task, the situation, specific strategies, mm-hmm. feedback tends to be much more effective. Yeah. It's a lot easier to hear, you know what, I, I underperformed today than it is to hear, I'm a terrible performer. Yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. And also what you said there, Adam, about questioning somebody's identity, if you will, around you know creativity was the example you gave. And I guess I draw parallels between that and um, Manson's Law, Mark Manson's book, uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Bleep, in which he says people often avoid most that which questions their identity the most. Um, so if I consider myself a very creative type of person, but I have been invited to some sort of a, I don't know, a round table with some people who are way more accomplished in the field than I am, maybe I'm not going to attend for fear of having my perception of self being shut down. Yeah, which is sad because that's the very situation where you're most likely to learn something. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of the, a lot of the feedback we give you know, I guess I would say the way it's received depends a lot on how we frame it. Mm-hmm. So there's one experiment that I love, which showed that you can make people 40% more receptive to negative feedback mm-hmm. just by saying about 19 words going into the conversation. 19 words. Which are roughly, I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations of you, and I'm confident that you can reach them. Uh. I don't know if that was actually 19. I might have miscounted. <laughs> but, you know, the the general message is, hey, you know, I... I I care about you and I believe in your potential. Mm. And I imagine that lowers people's defenses to the point where they start absorbing that feedback rather than just trying to deflect it. It does. You know, it, it goes back to that idea of, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not here to attack you. I'm actually here to coach you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, it only works if it, you know, if it doesn't seem manipulative. Yeah. I, I had a funny experience with this where I was, uh, I was in the classroom and I was, I was teaching some of this research. And about a week later, I gave out feedback forums mid-semester. And I had over a dozen students who wrote at the very top of the feedback forums, I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I'm confident you can reach them. And you know, I, 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 I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Yeah. Clearly, they'd been paying attention in class. Yeah. But you know, when the ninth person says that, you start to think, all right, I know what you're trying yeah. to do. Just stop. That's awesome. That's awesome. Adam, I wanted to um, digress and take this topic across to the world of humility, which is another concept you've unpacked in your brand new podcast. And I wanted to talk about this perhaps from the startup world perspective where you know, oftentimes we expect founders to be charismatic, to have this all-encompassing, unique vision and an unwavering self-belief. You know, they're supposed to have all the answers and oftentimes they expect themselves to have all the answers. They're afraid to show vulnerability, show weakness, um, be it to their team, to customers, to investors. And it's always about, you know, we're crushing it. But is this really the best way forward? Oh, you know, that that level of confidence is a great way to breed narcissism and end up being overconfident. Uh Uh, There's a lot of evidence that narcissistic founders end up making unnecessarily risky decisions because, you know, they, they feel like they have total conviction in their own judgment. And so they, they end up betting on, you know, on strategies, on products that, that may not actually be smart investments. And, you know, you could say, all right, but, but as an entrepreneur, I have to be confident. And I think there's actually a way to be humble and confident. My favorite example of this is an entrepreneur named Rufus Griscom. Mm-hmm. So uh, Rufus started a, a parenting website called Babel. And he just wanted to tell people the truth about what it's really like to be a parent after getting outsmarted on a daily basis by his three-year-old. <laughs> and uh, he, he went to venture capitalists to try to get funding. Mm-hmm. He did something that I'd never seen an entrepreneur do. He pitched his company by saying to all these investors, here are the three reasons you should not invest in Babel. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen someone do that on Dragon's Den. No. Right? You're, you're supposed to tell them why they should invest, not why they shouldn't. Yeah. He ended up getting over $3 million U.S. million in funding that year. Wow. And then two years later, he went to sell his company. And his pitch deck included a slide that said, here are the five reasons you should not buy Babel. And it was acquired for $40 million U.S. dollars. Mm. So something's going on here. What do you think it is? I think it projects a certain level of confidence. He has done the work to understand what might go wrong rather than just having this false veil of we're so good, which oftentimes suggests, okay, what are they not telling us here? Yeah, I think, I think that's a huge part of it. I, I definitely got the sense from, you know, from all the research I'd done on this that when, when he says, hey, you know, here, here are the things that are wrong with my company, 
it, it's a clear signal that he's done his homework. Mm. And if he's willing to tell you the truth about the flaws, maybe you can believe him a little bit more when he talks about the strengths. Yeah. I, I also think there's another element to this, which is uh, you're probably familiar with Danny Kahneman's work mm-hmm. on the availability bias. Yes. Uh, so basic idea being you know, that the easier something is to think of, the more true it feels. And the harder something is to think of, the more false it feels. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in Rufus's case, when he says, here are the three reasons why you should not invest in my company, he makes it harder for investors to come up with their own objections. And the harder they have to work to think about problems, the less, you know, fundamental they think those problems are. Mm. And I think that that leaves them walking away thinking, you know, hey, maybe maybe this company is actually pretty strong. And if you know your venture capitalists, there's there's one other layer to this, which is they, they normally like to show off how brilliant they are by saying things like, you know, Rufus, I'm really sorry to interrupt you on your title slide, but let me just tell you now why your company is doomed. Yeah. But they can't do that because Rufus has covered those bases. Mm-hmm. And so instead, they tend to show off their their genius by saying things like, oh, Rufus, those three problems you pointed out, those are nothing. I already know how to fix those. Yeah. And they talk themselves into, you know, believing that the problems are totally solvable. Yeah. I mean, what you've said there just reminds me of a conversation I had recently with uh, Annie Duke, who was the former World Series of Poker champion and recently published a book called uh, Thinking in Bets. And she was telling me about how a manager who stands up in front of the board with, say, and, and basically concedes that they have about 70% of the information. They're 70% sure that this is the right decision to make, but they're not 100% sure because of X, Y, and Z. That manager will always come across as more confident than the manager who just stands up and says, this is what we should do. Oh, really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. I guess there's parallels between that and the Rufus example you just gave because it shows that they've done their homework and they're able to diligently yeah. explain that. You know, I think so often both entrepreneurs and managers feel pressure to you know to to show that not only they've done their homework but they they actually know what the right answer is and i think i think part of having humility is saying you know what there may not be a right answer in this situation mm-hmm. or i may not know enough yet to get to the right answer mm. and i think that what that often leads people to do is instead of you know foreclosing on a decision or in annie's world you know making a premature bet to say, you know what, I've got to hold out for more information here. Exactly. Hold out for more information or perhaps not hold out for too long, as uh, Jeff Bezos likes to say. Wait for 70% of the information. Otherwise, if you wait for 100%, you've waited too long. Um, and just on the concept of humility, Adam, I know you, uh, you're, in, in your podcast you unpack the story of the Boston Celtics' Brad Stevens. Just on the topic of basketball, I know if you look back to, say, the 2000s, we had Kirby Bryant partnered up with Shaq at the LA Lakers, but... Kobe just couldn't stand playing, well, not necessarily second fiddle, but he couldn't stand sharing the limelight with Shaq. And so when Phil Jackson retired, as part of his exit interview, Kobe said, look, I'm tired of being a sidekick. And that year, the Lakers traded Shaq, even though the pair had combined to win three NBA titles. So does a lack of humility ultimately self-sabotage us, if you will? Yeah, I think that's what the evidence would suggest. Mm -hmm. So... If you look at the if you look at the data on humility, one of the interesting things is that if you get a bunch of stars together, they they often all want the ball, mm-hmm. right? So you know Kobe and Shaq both want to take the game winning shot. Yep. You know they want the ball when when it's crunch time, and that makes it really hard to coordinate. It also means that oftentimes you have the wrong person with the ball, right? So mm-hmm. if you think about Shaq, for example, Shaq could not shoot a free throw to save his life. <laughs> uh, one of the worst free throw shooters in NBA history. <laughs> yep. And yet, you know, he demanded the ball in, in situations where it was clear somebody was going to follow him. And then he was going to end up at the line and miss a bunch, of, a bunch of shots. And if, you know, if you brought a little more humility to that situation, there's this, uh, this research I really like by Brad Owens and his colleagues which shows that one of the benefits of having humility in a team is people are actually more likely to land in the right roles. Mm. As opposed to you know believing that they're going to be in a star in every situation, they're more likely to recognize where their strengths lie, but also where their weaknesses are. Mm. And so you know then you end up with the, with the right person taking the shot versus grabbing the rebound. Yeah. And I think that was, that was obviously missing in a situation like the, the Kobe-Shaq partnership. <laughs> and you know even though they were, they were talented enough to overcome it for a while, uh, I think the you know sort of this jockeying for position 
and wanting to to be the alpha dog yeah. can only last so long. Yeah, and and what you mentioned there, Adam, around not only identifying your strengths but also your weaknesses, and a humble leader or a humble team member will identify those weaknesses and therefore be a lot more open to learning and perhaps scribe to philosophies like strong opinions, weekly held, and always look to improve rather than. Not be humble, be a, as you said, become a narcissist, at which point you become a self-declared expert and you stop learning. And I know Henry Ford Jr., I believe it was, and I'm paraphrasing here, one of the quotes I read was that Ford wasn't interested in experts because the moment someone considers themselves an expert, they've stopped learning. Yeah, I think I think that's a huge risk. And, you know, it's funny, I didn't expect to see it in in basketball teams of all places. But mm. lo and behold, there's there's some research on uh, on NBA teams and how likely they are to win games. And it turns out that a team maxes out its probability of success when they've been playing about four years together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that's when they've developed the best routines, the most effective coordination. Right. All the players know each other's strengths and weaknesses, and it's a lot easier for them to work together. And you can think about, okay, you build up that shared experience. It makes you more effective. What happens afterward? Mm. Well, after about four years, the, the team's success starts to decay or decline. And, you know, maybe some of that is the players are just getting old by that point. Mm. But there's also evidence for routine rigidity, which is you, got, you, you get comfortable and you start resting on your laurels. And that complacency means that you're more predictable, that other teams are more likely to anticipate what you're going to do and develop good strategies to stop you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think, again... The, the benefit of humility there is that it prevents you from resting on your laurels. It, it forces you to say, all right, how are we going to get better? How are we going to improve? We never want to stop learning. Yeah, and I think there's lessons learned or, or parallels between what you've just said there and the modern organization that just because you found product market fit and you know, you've made millions of dollars on an, an existing business model doesn't mean that it will continue to make you money tomorrow and that you always need to be learning and adapting to, to the changes because the rest of the competition will catch up. Yeah, and I think you know, it's, it's, it's funny. when Before I started you know, doing research on humility, I really thought about it as, as a virtue that you're supposed to display after you succeed, mm. right? right? So nobody, <laughs> nobody likes to hear a star uh, who seems to be vain or arrogant or narcissistic. And the more I've, I've dug into it, the more I've realized that actually humility is a, a virtue you want to cultivate before success because it allows you to stay in that mindset of, of saying, look, we're not perfect. We always have ways to get better. And that means that you're going to sustain your success longer once you achieve it. Because you're not going to end up sort of becoming uh, too convinced of, of your own greatness. We always find anomalies to, to rules such as uh, Floyd Money Mayweather. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes talent is a substitute. <laughs> but, you know, I think that for the most part, right, on average, yeah. uh, the, of course. The, the individuals who are able to maintain some degree of, of accurate self-awareness, who stay grounded are in a better position to continue adapting and learning and evolving. Definitely, definitely. And on the topic of burstiness, a lot of our listeners are either corporate innovation executives or entrepreneurs and founders. And I guess the common conventional wisdom in the space of, say, ideation and brainstorming up until now has been, you know, defer judgment, go for quantity instead of quality, build upon each other's ideas, the whole yes and uh, philosophy. Yet, some of the research that you're starting to unpack or some of the case studies that you're starting to unpack suggest something totally different. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Brainstorming has been popular since the 1950s Mm -hmm. when an advertising executive created the rules. And when when you actually study the rules, uh, they don't don't have the effects that we, we tend to assume. So, you know, we've got now four decades of data showing that if you were to take five individuals in a brainstorming group, and instead put them in separate rooms to work alone, on average, you will get more ideas and better ideas, mm. which you know really flies in the face of, of this idea that, that groups are supposed to be better than individuals at brainstorming. Yep. And if, if you look at what happens in these groups, I think we've actually all experienced it. There's one problem called production blocking, which is we can't all talk at once. Mm-hmm. So some people eventually get silenced and we miss their ideas. Uh, second problem is ego threat. Yeah. So I don't want to look stupid, and I'm most likely to hold back on my most creative ideas. And then there's just a conformity effect where, where I want to jump on the bandwagon of what's popular or what the highest status person or the boss seems to, to favor. Mm. And so that, that all really hurts creativity. And I think the, you know, the solution to this is called brain writing, where you let individuals generate ideas separately. Mm-hmm. 
And then you have them come together and begin discussing and evaluating and building. And, you know, oftentimes when you get to the peak of that, that's called uh, creative burstiness, where the room literally sounds like it's bursting with ideas. <laughs> but you want to give people a chance to develop those ideas first. Yeah. Uh, you know, and really incubate them individually before you put them in a group setting. Yeah, I think the whole ego threat reminds me of a conversation I had with Matthew E. May, um, who published the book Winning the Brain Game. And he unpacked seven fatal flaws of thinking that he found in large organizations, and one of which was perhaps one of the most critical, which was self-censoring, whereby you've hired people to do a job, you've hired them for their talents, yet they don't feel comfortable sharing their um, opinions, observations, thoughts, with the rest of the organization for fear of, as you said, looking stupid, which just seems to me like an incredible waste of, of talent. It is. It is. It's sad to see how often that happens. Adam, I want to wrap up with our three question lightning round. Sure. Number one was if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? Oh, that's such a tough question. <laughs> you know, I think that I would probably say at the moment, I'd want to work for uh, either NASA or a space flight company figuring out how people are going to get along as they fly to Mars and then how to build a society on Mars. Fantastic. I just think that would be fascinating. Awesome answer. And question number two, Adam, is if you could ask anybody a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? I would probably go to Abraham Lincoln and mm -hmm. ask him how we can get the world out of the political mess we're all in right now. That's a fantastic answer. And something just told me he's going to say Lincoln. He's going to say Lincoln, and, and there it was. <laughs> <laughs> predictable. And lucky last. I mean, yeah, well, predictable, but very, very valid. And lucky last was something you've probably been asked before, but nonetheless, I'm going to ask you again because I think our listeners, if they haven't read a ton of your articles, will get some value out of it. And it really is all about productivity hacks and you know rituals and routines that help you stay on top of your game because you've been a, obviously a decorated author now for a number of years, an award-winning professor. You've got your podcast. You've delivered a number of TED Talks. You're obviously kicking a lot of goals. So how do you keep churning out high-quality content year after year? Well, I, I'll leave it to you to judge the quality. <laughs> Uh, in terms of productivity, I, I'd say three things. So so humble. Well, no, I'm just uh, I'm just a trying to have an accurate appraisal of my strengths and weaknesses. But yep. the first thing I would say is, if you want to be more productive, productivity is the wrong goal. Mm -hmm. I think we're we're at our most productive when we're motivated to to work on a problem that's interesting and important. Uh, either you know because we're fascinated by it, or because it benefits others, or both. And so I would, if you want to increase your productivity, I would say. Think about why you're doing the work, who it's affecting, you know, why it matters to other people, uh, and you know, what is it that excited you about it in the first place, mm -hmm. and that often kickstarts your motivation. Yeah. Uh, second thing is I picked up a great tip uh, from reading Hemingway once upon a time, mm -hmm. who used to leave sentences unfinished. And you know, I, I always thought, you, you want to sit down and write until you're done. And as I thought about it, I, I thought it was interesting and worth trying, and I've, I've adopted it as a regular habit because it reduces getting into time. If, if you leave a sentence incomplete, tomorrow when you go back to, to the computer, you have somewhere to pick up right where you left off. Mm. And it's much easier to get back into it than to start over you know, from scratch. Yep. So I like that a lot. And then the, the last thing I would say that I think is, is really valuable from a productivity standpoint is there's a lot of white space that most people don't use. And I, uh, I asked a, a couple of colleagues a few years ago, uh, what you know, if if I am reasonably productive, what are the things that they've learned from me? And they all said the same thing, which is when there are three minutes left in a meeting, most of the time they just chit chat. Whereas I, I say, all right, we've got three minutes left. You know, let's let's analyze some data, or you know, let's uh, let's put together another piece of this presentation. And uh, I think sometimes there's efficiency to be gained from using those tiny little windows. Beautiful. And I guess on the leaving sentences unfinished uh, concept, it's kind of like writing your to-do list, say, the day before, so that your brain is already thinking about it, so that when you get to work the next morning, you just start getting stuff done rather than coming in, okay, so uh, what am I going to work on today? I think that's exactly right. Fantastic, Adam. Well, thank you so much for giving up some time to appear on Future Squared. Um, you've been an awesome guest. I'm sure our audience will unpack a lot of insights from this conversation. If they want to learn more, they can head over to adamgrant.net. They can check out the brand new podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever else they find awesome podcasts. Head over to ted.com to see many of your keynote talks and also hit you up on Twitter at, at 
Adam M. Grant. Is there anywhere else or anything else they should be checking out, Adam? No, I just uh, I really appreciate how thoughtful and amazingly prepared you are. And I apologize for my cold. <laughs> not a problem, mate. Not a problem. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And, you know, I'd love to do it again sometime when we have an opportunity to really dig a little bit deeper into these concepts. But it's been great. And I hope you uh, get well very soon. Sounds like fun. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, Steve again. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to discuss episodes like this one, request guests for new episodes, propose questions, and access exclusive podcast-related content, join the brand new Future Squared Facebook group. Just search for the Future Squared group on Facebook or visit bit.ly forward slash Future Squared group. That's bit.ly forward slash Future Squared group. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, please take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. This episode was powered by Collective Campus. Until next time, Future Squared is out.